Grace and peace to you, dear brothers and sisters of the Larchmont Avenue Church. As has been said before, I thank my God every time I remember you, and I do. I thank you for the time and um, the experience I had to be able to serve as the associate pastor here with, with Reverend Bill and with many of you as I began my ministry. I thank you for that. I thank you for the invitation, um, along with my wife Mihi, to be here with you today and to help you as you all continue to celebrate in your 100th anniversary. What a wonderful celebration. I am honored to be a part of it in this way. Again, I'm thankful for this congregation, the way that you welcomed a young seminary graduate who thought he knew more than he actually did <laughs> into your community of faith, and you welcomed me, you welcomed me, he, and your grace abounded, and I give you thanks. I'm especially thankful to you, Bill, my first head of staff, my mentor, my teacher, my colleague, and my friend. Thank you, Bill, for the encouragement, the support, the grace, the love that you have given to me, to me, to my family while I was at LAC, and throughout the years. Bill, you are a blessing, and I do give thanks to God for you. I bring greetings this morning from the First Presbyterian Church in Bloomington, Indiana. The ministry at First Pres in Bloomington in part has been shaped by all of you because you shaped me while I was here. And so for most of this, they give thanks. <laughs> it's awesome to be back here. To be in this pulpit, it's been, 2000, it's been since 2005, I think, since I've been back here, in the pulpit at least, and honestly, I never thought I would be, but it's a joy, a joy to be here with all of you and in the presence of God as we worship God today. But since I'm here now, let me then turn to God's word as it comes to us in Psalm 86, I will be reading the first 10 verses of the psalm and then jumping a little bit ahead to verse 16 and 17. Brothers and sisters, hear now the word of God. Incline your ear, O Lord, and answer me, for I am poor and needy. Preserve my life, for I am devoted to you. Save your servant who trusts in you. You are my God, be gracious to me, O Lord, for to you do I cry all day long. Gladden the soul of your servant, for to you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. For you, O Lord, are good and forgiving, abounding in steadfast love to all who call on you. Give ear, O Lord, to my prayer, listen to my cry of supplication. In the day of my trouble I call on you, for you will answer me. There is none like you among the gods, O Lord, nor are there any works like yours. All the nations you have made shall come and bow down before you, O Lord, and shall glorify your name. For you are great and do wondrous things. You alone are God. Turn to me and be gracious to me. Give your strength to your servant. Save the child of your serving maid. Show me a sign of your favor, so that those who hate me may see it and be put to shame, because you, Lord, have helped me and comforted me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends, will you pray with me? Good and gracious God, as your word has been read and now proclaimed, we pray that you would quiet within us every voice but your own, so that we might hear your word of truth that you have for us today. In Christ's name we pray, and all God's children said, Amen. 
Well, Bill is, Bill is right. We have uh, three children, Desmond and Anna. They are three and a half year old twins turning four in February. And then we have Oswald. We call him Ozzy. He's a year and a half turning two also in February. They are with Mihi's parents. Many of you have asked if we brought them or if we were planning to, and Bill's right. Yes, this is a date. We are glad to be here without them. We wanted to enjoy ourselves. <laughs> this is not being recorded, is it? I, I <laughs> Desmond, Dana, Ozzy, I never said that. Ozzy's in this Godzilla stage, you know, where he just kind of can't talk and he walks around and shouts and just knocks stuff over. So. <laughs> We thought that would be best left to uh, grandma and grandpas outside of Chicago. Being back here in Larchmont has just brought back, and Mamaroneck as well, a flood of memories. All of them good. And faces, and names, and stories, and coffee shops, and restaurants, past conversations. It's just been wonderful, and it's kind of been nostalgic as well as remembering back to the beginning of, of my ministry and my service to God in, in this way, began thinking back also about even the time before that when I was in seminary and even the time before that when I was considering entering into seminary and beginning this, this wild ride called ministry. And I was wondering if I've ever shared with you, I'm not sure that I, I ever did, the time when I was considering seminary and I was looking for a sign as to whether or not I should go to seminary. I went to Princeton on what they call a prospective student weekend. And the point of the weekend is to see if seminary, or in this case, particularly Princeton, made sense. And so like a lot of colleges and universities do, they have us come to campus we met some of the students and we sat in on a class or two and we had an interview with someone in the admissions office. Now I had thought at this point that I had wanted to go to seminary. I had some experiences that have led me to believe that seminary might just in fact be in my deck of cards to become a minister. I had what I believed was God's calling for this vocation but I gotta tell you, any honest minister will tell you that they try to resist it somewhat or maybe find some kind of loophole around it when they first receive that call. Rare is the person who will immediately say, here I am, Lord. At least I was not that person. I thought, ministry, maybe. I'll do it. But I need a clearer sign. Show me a sign, O oh God. And so I remember one night, towards the end of this exploratory weekend in Princeton, I decided to go outside. This was after all of the planned and scheduled events were over. I went outside on the quad and just sat down on one of the benches and was just quiet. And I just sat there and I prayed, hoping to see a sign or to hear a sign from God. It was dark and quiet. I could just sit and think and pray. I remember praying and feeling, uh, as I was praying, this, this feeling, this wave of conviction just come over me like some sort of sign telling me, yes, Andy, yes, you should do this. I'm pretty sure that I began to weep, taking all of this in, especially after that clarifying sign that I had just experienced, because that's a powerful thing. And so I readied myself, ready to go back inside, and I picked up my head and I looked straight ahead of me and wouldn't you know it, then I saw a sign. Another sign, a literal sign, an actual road sign that clearly said, do not enter. <laughs> I chalked it up to being a sign more about traffic patterns on campus than being a sign about my vocational direction and I applied to seminary anyway. Show me a sign, O oh Lord. That night I received two of them. 
I can only hope that I paid attention to the right one. The psalm that's in today's psalm, Psalm 86, is looking for a sign as well. Show me a sign. Show me a sign of your favor. He asks this near the end of the psalm, but if we back all the way up towards the beginning, we can see why it is that he's looking for a sign. He writes, Incline your ear, O Lord, and answer me, for I am poor and needy. Be gracious to me, O Lord. He claims here to be poor and needy, and he's asking God for some help and a sign of God's favor. To me, at least, that says that he's maybe not fully comfortable being poor and needy. So maybe, maybe like a young person trying to discern a call about where to go in life, Or maybe, like a middle-aged person who is unclear about what direction their life um, is now going and they are considering a major change, but at the same time wondering if it's too late or too risky. Or maybe, maybe like an elderly person who has lived a full life, a life full of wonderful blessings and achievements, and they used to be able to do so many things, but not so much anymore. Maybe, just maybe like all of these people, maybe like all of us, the psalmist is coming to terms with who he really is, poor and needy. We could say that the Bible's story is our story, and I believe that to be true. In Psalm 86, the psalmist begins by declaring, I am poor and needy, and so are we. Now on the surface, it seems very hard for us to make this claim. Poor and needy, I mean, look at us. This is Larchmont. Look at where we live, the cars we drive, the clothes that we wear, the vacations we take, the parties and the sporting events that we attend, the computers and the cell phones that we update Facebook on, telling everyone about what it was we had for dinner or what concert we are attending. Sure, maybe most of us might not be rolling in it, and most of us seem to be doing pretty okay. Poor and needy? Us? After I left LAC, I took a call at a church in New Jersey, and at this church we had a sister relationship with a church in Kenya. One Sunday, one of their elders came to preach for for us, and he was talking about being poor and needy in parts of his native Africa. And he stopped us all in our tracks when he said, you know that there are those who are poor and needy, and then there are those who are American." poor, and needy. What he meant by that was not only do most of our poor and needy still have cars and refrigerators and a place to live, American poor and needy also have networks and systems, whether they be governmental or religious, systems of support in place or at least available to help, where many other places around the world they do not. But us? Us? Really us? Poor and needy? Clearly there are brothers and sisters among us who are in need and who experience the pains of poverty, but looking around here I can see that most of us have on clean clothes. Nice clothes. There may be one or two designer clothes here today. We'll have lunch either at home or at a restaurant after church. We have a bed to sleep in tonight. We've got a roof over our heads. Most of us have all of our basic needs met and our wants met too. So maybe, just maybe then, maybe we are poor in other areas. Maybe at times we're spiritually poor. And maybe we prioritize other things in life, never really engaging our faith, and then we wonder why God feels so distant. Or maybe we are 
so not financially poor and needy that it can become way too easy for us to think that, well, everyone else should be this way too. If only they worked harder, if only they applied themselves. So maybe at times we are poor of compassion, poor of goodwill. Maybe we are needy because as life goes on, we realize more and more just how much we need other people. And we come to understand that sometimes other people are just, well, they're too busy or they're needed somewhere else and they can't be there for us and it hurts. And maybe we realize that we are needy because there are many times in life when we come to understand just how much we need a community of faith like this one and most of all, how much we need God. Because when you stop and think about it, we are like the psalmist because we too are poor and we too are needy, which for people of faith is really just another way of saying we simply do not have the resources to save ourselves. What we need is the love of God and the grace of God. Show me a sign, show me a sign, O oh God, but not of how much in need of your grace I am or in how much in need of your love I am because we know all of that already. I know all of that already. I mean, even if we feel invincible, even when we feel invincible, we know. We know that we are vulnerable and we know that we are helpless at times. Just ask the widow. Just ask the man who lost his wife to cancer. Just ask the adult son with a mother in the Alzheimer unit. Just ask the wife who sits by her husband's hospital bed. Just ask the couple waiting on the results of the blood work from the lab to come in. Just ask the skilled laborer who cannot find work that pays enough to support the family. Just ask the frustrated stay-at-home mom who is wondering what in the world has happened or what will happen to her career. Just ask the person who lives in isolation and the one who feels all alone and the one who tragically feels unloved by anyone, especially God. Show me a sign, O oh God, but not of how much in need we are because we know that already. Show me a sign, O oh God, but not a sign of who we are, the poor and needy children of God, because we know that already. Show us a sign, O oh God. Show us, God, who you are. We believe that the Bible is the divine revelation of who God is. So we look at the psalm and we see that, that God is good. We see that God is not only good, but the word of God informs us that God is great. Show me a sign, the psalmist requests. Show me a sign of your favor. That's what he's looking for. That's what he wants to see. That's what he's asking God for, a sign of God's favor. Now, there are some who would have you believe that to have God's favor means riches, beautiful spouse, and a house on the sound with new cars parked in the driveway. Some would have you believe that a sign of God's favor would look like any of those things. They would maybe even tell you to be more favor-minded. But you know, that's a different gospel than the one I believe and the one I preach. And it surely is not how I understand God's favor. Because I don't see God's favor being some kind of reward for doing everything right or thinking positive thoughts or just being a happy little Christian. For me, it's the opposite. I see God's favor as something that comes to us because of who we are the poor and needy children of God, unable to rescue ourselves, children who need love and children who need grace. And God's favor has so much less to do with goods and so much more to do with grace. We see that God is not only good, but great. Show me a sign. Let the great beauty and the majesty of creation be your sign. We see that God is forgiving. Show me a sign. 
You know that one thing, that one thing that you just can't seem to forgive yourself for? God forgives it. And let this empty cross that couldn't contain the risen Christ be your sign. We see that God is gracious and abounding in steadfast love. Show me a sign. Do you ever feel unloved or unworthy of love? Well, let the baptismal font be a sign of God's unwavering love for you and for this church. And remember that at the font, we are reminded that God's love never falters. It never goes away. It never lessens. Because there, we are claimed as God's child forevermore. And nothing, absolutely nothing, brothers and sisters, can ever change that. But you know, we'd maybe be just a little too inward looking if we thought this was all about us and God's favor for us. It might be too narrow if we thought this was just about us because God is bigger than just us. And so perhaps, or maybe, Maybe we could reframe this and shift it some. And maybe see that it is not always us who is looking for a sign of God's favor, love, and grace. Maybe, just maybe, it's someone else. And maybe you and me and this church are called to be that sign of favor for that someone else. We're able to do it. You're able to do it. Don't you dare doubt that for a moment. Because we've got the power of the Holy Spirit and we worship a living God and a risen Christ. We've been baptized, which also means we have been charged with being a sign of God's grace to those who are poor and needy too. In this community of faith, you've been doing it now for a hundred years. A hundred years. How wonderful. But you know that God has not just given you a wonderful past with a goodly heritage, but a future too. More opportunities to be signs. And so maybe for you, maybe for you that means that you keep your energy up with the Midnight Run or Hope Community Services or the Large Mont Mamaroneck Hunger Task Force the other mission projects that you all are engaged in. Maybe that means that you keep working and doing what you have been doing, or maybe it means that you find new ways of engaging with the physically poor and needy. Maybe it also means that you can engage with the spiritually poor, the spiritually needy. When's the last time you invited someone to come to church with you? Maybe it just means the way that we treat our neighbors, our fellow human beings. Well, however it may be, and however it may look, let us never forget that not only can we see signs of God's favor abounding in all around us, but we can be signs of God's favor. We can move from lip service to life service for all those who are poor and needy in all of the many, many ways that people can be poor and needy, those who cry to the Lord saying, show me a sign. By God's grace, we can see those signs. By God's grace, we can be those signs. Thanks be to God. Amen.